All right, well, that's a good good starting slide for people to see on the live show. Uh, I'm Will Brownsberger, state senator, and we're here to talk about, and I'm gonna say the long name of this. It is a mouthful, but it deals with a mouthful. It's an act to reform police standards and shift resources to build a more equitable, fair and just commonwealth that values black lives and communities of color. So this is a piece of legislation. We refer to it by the three major words, reform, shift, and build. Um, I am going to kind of stay in a little bit of an informal chat mode here for a little while while people uh, drift into the meeting. I want to give people time to show up. Um, hey, David, I don't know. Welcome, folks. I, I, hey, Steve. Nice to see you. Ronnie, good to see you. Um, some folks I haven't met yet, but um, thanks for getting on. Um, this is, I, I, everybody that's, on, I, I, the email that I sent out inviting to this people to this call is, is um, was people who had written to me who are, who are registered voters in my district. So you're, you're, you're all folks that live in, you know, Fenway or ba uh, Back Bay or Alston or Brighton or Watertown or Belmont. And you're all folks that, that care about um, criminal justice uh, or care about police, police reform. And I, and I know that those words, the choice of words is loaded there. Police um, shift resources, um, et cetera. A lot of possible choices of words there. So we'll wait just a minute. Why don't I? Why don't I get started? I just honor the fact that you guys have gotten on the call on time, and I'll just, I'll just, I'll just dive into it. Um, so let me let me get some things up on the screen here and start talking. Um, so, uh, every can it, does everybody is everybody able to see the slide content? Can I get a thumbs up on that? Everybody able to see? Yeah, okay. Good, great. So um, this is the title of the act. Let me tell you what the themes of the act are. And I'm, I'm going to run through this and I'm going to take about 15, 20 minutes doing this and then we'll just have a discussion and we can stay on for up to an hour and a half. Um, so the, I'm just, Got multiple things up here, and I got to make sure. There we go. Okay. So the uh, themes of the bill that we're passing, there's three major themes. Number one, we want to reduce the risk of police misconduct. However well we may think we're doing in Massachusetts, we can never say never. And we, we recognize that the cost of a George Floyd type incident um, is just vastly unacceptable. So we should be doing everything we can to reduce the risk of police misconduct. Um, and that's, that's a major theme of this film. Beyond that, we're focused on how can we shift our resources uh, and the focus of effort from force and punishment to de-escalation and helping. And of course, there's a broader theme of fighting racism which endures and continues and is reflected in this bill in several different important ways. So within the idea of um, reducing risk, we do, we do two major things. One is narrowing the legal authorization for use of force. And two is increasing accountability. So focusing on the authorization for use of force this bill makes a number of important changes. Um, as you can see, ban chokeholds. Uh, now, currently, it is lawful for a police officer to use a gun to shoot a person who is fleeing arrest or is escaping from custody. And we are saying no to that, which, is very, which eliminates a great many of the occasions in which officers use deadly force. There are situations where it's perhaps almost defensible for them to do that. But if you think about it, if somebody is running away from them and is not about to shoot somebody else, then we're asking that officer to serve as basically 
uh, jury, judge, and executioner of of somebody who they believe has committed a crime. And and we just we don't I, number one don't feel that that's quite right. Um, you know, it's fundamentally wrong. In fact, uh, but also it creates a lot of possibility for error. And you know, error as bad as you know, somebody's offered the officers under an enormous amount of pressure, under a lot of heat, and um, so they do think these things happen, like the case where they they shot the guy shot a um, somebody who's running away after at a traffic stop, and so that that's that of course is illegal even under today's laws, but w there are we, there are situations that where that use of force would be legal. I mean, you know, if somebody, if they had just seen somebody shoot somebody and then that person ran away, they could shoot that person. But we're saying no to that. And we know that that has a cost in terms of law enforcement, but we think it will reduce the probability of tragic incidents. In the same way, we're saying that you can't, a lot of, a lot of times police go through the door uh, on no-knock warrants um, to seize evidence, to, you know, to prevent the, uh, a drug dealer from in a house from flushing the drugs down the toilet, for example. And we're saying no to that. That is not an acceptable reason for a no-knock warrant. The only reasons for a no-knock warrant will be the safety of the officers or the safety of somebody inside. You know, picture one of these uh, you know, CSI type things at the end of the end of the program where they save a, a child or somebody who's locked up in the basement and they have to, you know, blast in those kind of scenarios. But never as a as a predicate for never, never just to collect evidence. Um, and we, there's you know, things like tear gas, uh, we're saying don't use those just to protect property, only use those when there's actually people are, 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 are apparently going to be hurt by a crowd. And we want to encourage de-escalation planning. And we're saying that we, this, that when, so that whenever that happens, we need to report it to a central agency that we're going to create. Uh, in this bill further, and I'll talk to you about that um, in a second, and that that agency will review and see if the use of force was in fact uh, justified. Um, in addition, I don't, I don't mention this on this slide yet, but the other thing is that this does create a statutory inter duty to intervene, um, and um, that, that, that is a, one of the other elements that, you know, if you see an officer uh, in, in engaging in an inappropriate use of force, you should intervene and or uh, should report the incident. So though that's the authorization, that's the use of force group of things in the bill. Uh, those are controversial, we're getting some pushback on them uh, as having gone too far. And some, in some cases, a few people think we haven't gone far enough, but really I think these are very strong strong measures. Um, the other thing we do uh, is, is focus on police accountability. And we do something which nobody has really proposed yet. I mean, we, there's, there's a lot of, most other states have a statewide police certification authority of some kind. But what we're doing here is we're um, requiring that every single complaint against a police officer go directly to that agency. And then in cases of serious conduct, that agency will directly investigate and if necessary, take the license away from police officers. So this is a new idea that you're gonna have a licensing authority in effect. So just as you have to have a license to be a doctor or a license to be a barber or a license to be uh, any, any one of a number of things, uh, and you could lose that license, that will be the same for a police officer. And this agency will receive complaints across the state. So complaints, will not be buried in police departments. Uh, if there's a serious complaint, um, a citizen go, can go directly to this agency, which is independent, which is comprised of a majority of civilians. Uh, it's at the, as it's currently constant, drafted, it's six, off, six police representatives, eight civilians, including a couple of fairly neutral civilians like a retired judge. Um, and um, this, is a, this is a powerful, new structure in the state, which I think will very much change the dynamics in a positive way, creating a, a lot more transparency um, and um, accountability in, in the policing field. Um, in addition to that, we create stronger civil, civil remedies for misconduct. Uh, this disqualified, the qualified immunity defense issue we address. And uh, this is, you know, the Justice Department can come into communities and um, bring lawsuits to change the police department with injunctive relief. And we're now saying the attorney general should be able to do that. 
And we also speak to the issue of non-disclosure agreements and police misconduct settlements and say that cannot be done. So those, those are a couple of major things. Uh, we also follow the governor's recommendations in terms of strengthening the state police. Uh, we do a, we create a body to camera task force. I know that some, it's an interesting controversy conversation about uh, body cameras because some people feel they don't work. Uh, some people feel they do work to increase accountability. Uh, and our view, our incoming view is that um, it depends on how it's done, what the rules are. And so we want to see a successful, uh, we want to figure out what it takes to have a successful implementation of body cameras uh, and, and consider uh, on a statewide basis, whether we want that to be a policy or not. So that's, we, we're not judging that question, but we're having a, a task force to study it. We recognize it as an important question, potentially to increase accountability. Now we go to a different theme, uh, which is shifting resources. And we've got uh, provisions that would uh, require disclosure of military, the, any acquisition of military type equipment and require civilian authorization of military equi equipment author of acquisitions. So uh, this means the, uh, in, in terms of local police departments having you know, any, any kind of heavier weaponry, uh, this will require the approval of their local legislative body. This, right now, I think there's, a, particularly at the sheriff level, there's a lot of equipment that just gets slid down from the federal government to these agencies that they really don't have a good use for. And we're saying that has to be approved on a civilian basis by the Secretary of Public Safety uh, with transparency that you know, others, others can see uh, as to statewide agencies and to local, and at the local level by whether it's the city council, the local legislative body. Uh, and there is an amendment pending which would require that legislative body or the Secretary of Public Safety to have a hearing before uh, doing that, before permit, you know, making, appro making approval of any kind of acquisition. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, in the same theme of shifting, we want to expand uh, mental health and interventions and make them more community driven. You know, there's been a lot of focus on, well, let's train police officers to better, res better respond to mental health in, uh, situations uh, or other kinds of situations. And we think that's a good idea. But even more important is to think about, can we, can we develop um, systems that um, respond to social problems uh, with, with a civilian, you know, without somebody who doesn't have a gun on their hip, which is sort of intrinsically uh, escalating. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a, another element of it. Now, school to prison pipeline, uh, currently uh, schools, and that creates a tendency in some, some people's, in some institutions to rely on uh, criminal and sanctions within the school to enforce discipline. We want to make that entirely the choice of a superintendent to whether they think it's necessary. Right now, it's mandated. Um, we, um, there is this concept of keeping uh, kids that are in school, um, in school, uh, and in the juvenile justice system. Uh, in other words, so instead of, it's currently at 18, you, be, you become part of the adult criminal justice system if you get in trouble. But we want to avoid that and keep kids who are in school within the um, juvenile system. That's a larger controversial thing, which is actually, we could not agree with this. This bill, I should say, is the product of a working group who you know, listened to um, ideas that have been, we, we, we met exhaustively over the past few weeks in the, wake, in the wake of what happened with George Floyd to review uh, pending legislation and other ideas from other sources and all the, all, the, all the advocacy groups to say, what can we do? What should we do right now? And um, so we took, we took uh, the best of ideas, some of it's legislation that's already filed in the Senate, has already had hearings, some of the legislation that's already fi filed in the House, already had hearings, uh, and we, we talked it through. And this is one area, this issue of the raising the age of adult criminal jurisdiction uh, was something that we uh, could not quite agree on. Um, now, let's see. So now we're going to the reinvesting criminal justice resources and impacted communities. This is a, an idea that's, that's been on the table as, as we save. We, we've made a lot of efforts over the past uh, decade, and particularly in our criminal justice reforms in 2018, to reduce incarceration, to address uh, reform at the back end of the system, what happens after somebody's been arrested, 
That's where most of our attention has been. That's where most of the advocacy has been instead of on the street policing issues. Um, but this goes back to that issue of uh, savings from um, incarceration reductions and says, let's use half of that money and invest, reinvest it in the community in the form of jobs, um, job training, education, and so forth, youth activities to prevent crimes, create opportunities, and do that in the communities that have been most affected, the communities of color and poverty that have been most affected by, um, by the, by the over-incarceration that was what we were doing for a few decades there. Um, we, we have a, 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 another collection of measures that speaks to the issue of racial profiling, specifically banning racial profiling, which has not been banned in Massachusetts per se, and then increasing the amount of data that we collect on all police stops. So if police force somebody to stop on the street, they have to give them a receipt and record the fact that they uh, stopped them. Um, this is a controversial thing. It's been the subject of continuing back and forth in several different pieces of legislation. We're keeping it on the table. Um, and then we've got uh, training requirements for police and the creation of a new African-American commission, uh, which um, should help make, should help focus people on, on building opportunity for, for African-Americans uh, in a whole host of different ways. We have an Asian American commission, and this is kind of on that uh, model, um, and um, we'll, we'll create another, another center of focus on improving uh, the lives of Black Americans. So um, coming back to the themes, reduce the risk of police misconduct, shift from force and punishment, fight racism. That is the summary. Where are we in this process? We have come up with this bill on Monday uh, after you know several weeks of really intense work, uh, and then we we're, we're receiving amendments today. We've got 146 amendments proposed to the bill uh, that have been filed, and we'll review those tomorrow, sort those out, and then on Thursday we'll go through the debate process and hopefully get the bill to the stage of engrossment, which means the Senate is done with it. Uh, with the House is moving forward with legislation in the same space. We're looking forward to that, and we're looking forward to getting the bills together in a conference committee, sorting out differences between the House and Senate, and hopefully putting something on the governor's desk uh, very, very soon. Um, so that is the presentation, and I'm going to see if I can shift back to uh, seeing just me, and let's have a conversation. So um, thank you all for being part of this. I hope that was a helpful overview of what we're talking about. And uh, now I'd like to just, first of all, acknowledge, I see Dave Rogers, Representative Dave Rogers of the House of Representatives, who's been a strong advocate for criminal justice reform. And I believe Representative John Hecht is also on the uh, call. And he has also been a wonderful advocate for criminal justice reform. So thank you to both of you for uh, joining us. Um, so we'll, we'll take, uh, this is a discussion. I wanted to get this out there. I wanted to get this out there to folks that have been in touch with me and calling for reform and to have a conversation about what we're doing and to get your thoughts and feedback. Um, so uh, the floor is open and we'll go, we'll go, we'll recognize uh, people who's got their hands up uh, and that's, we'll just go in order as people put their hands up. The uh, chat stream is open so people can say things in the chat, but basically I won't really be able to uh, intent uh, to, to keep up with uh, the chat. I'll be focused on, on people who put their hands up in the, um, in, uh, and, and, the and, and we'll be focused on the verbal conversation. Um, so um, I see Constantine, you want to, rec let's recognize Constantine. And, um, Hi, Senator. Thank you for the Thank you for the presentation, um, and thank you for having this. Um, I'm wondering, uh, there was a, forgive me for bringing in the LAPD, but the LA Times did a study that said over 18 years, eight or over 10 years, only less than 8% of the LAPD's calls were for um, violent situations. And yeah. I'm wondering what is... Uh, I'm wondering about basically what are we doing so that the police, so that there are alternatives to calling the police, you know, so that 
so that there are, you know, so there are social workers, there are people who, I mean, you know, the cops have too much responsibility because we're asking them to, to do too much in part. And, you know, we have a traffic enforcement division that all, doesn't enforce traffic. They just give out parking tickets. So, you know, can we, is there any way to, to remove some of these responsibilities from the police? So that's the conversation we're having. I mean, there, there, I, I'm not going to try to flip back and forth to the slides, but we, if you, if you may, you may recall we had a slide on expanding mental health interventions, and more broadly, I think the the, the conversation there is about expanding social work interventions. I think uh, we don't. I, I wouldn't say we've gone gotten too far on that bill because I think what we've done. Uh, excuse me. In this bill, we have not gotten made too much progress on that. It's sort of a down payment on it. I think ultimately, where you'd like to be, if possible is to have more of a social work 911 model so that when people, you know, if there's an argument or something that they can be settled without force, um, you know, homelessness, uh, that we can have a, a social work response more consistently. But to be fair, I think that, you know, many of the cities uh, do a pretty good job of that. I and mean, certainly Boston has a pretty good integration of mental health services, homelessness services with their police force. Watertown uh, is a got is taking advantage of grants for that as well. Um, so, but the question of can you shift resources to a social work response, that means building a social work response system. I had a conversation with the National Association of Social Workers chapter in Massachusetts where they are really thinking about that. So you could, you could have DPH contract with regional agencies who would then employ social workers who are ready to respond and, 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 and develop a different type of response to problems. So yeah, I think that's very much on the table. Um, we only make limited progress on that, that in this bill, but this is not the last bill. Uh, this is what we're getting done today. So next up, I see, when I say hands up, by the way, I don't mean physical hands up. There's this sort of hands up system in the corner of the, uh, that hopefully everybody can see. Let's call Sarah season because she's holding her hands up. I saw it, but everybody else, try to remember that you got to put your actually your hand up in the system. That'll work, Sarah. You're still on mute, Sarah. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, have you addressed issues of domestic violence and sexual assault, and how would they be handled with a reduction in police forces? So I don't think, I mean, you know, domestic violence requires police intervention. And I think that's a totally fair question. I mean, I think, I think there, are, there are a lot of situations that require police officers and, um, or, or can require police officers. Uh, and domestic violence typically is one of them because when you get that call, typically people are extremely angry. Uh, you know, that, you know the, the, there is a crisis that's, in mid, that's, in, you know, that's going on and somebody's calling the, 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 the police in a panic asking for help and they need a force response at that time. And so what that means is that you have to have force response ready. Um, oh yeah, by the way, somebody's putting in the chat and I'm just gonna read this so everybody knows. You can raise your hand by clicking on the participants button and then you will see that there is a raise hand button within that menu. But to, to, but to stay on Sarah's question, which is a really important one, uh, and I think it, it speaks to this sort of force structure issue. We have to have people who are ready to respond to emergencies. Domestic violence is, I think, one of the most important ones that we're gonna respond to that's sort of gonna happen ongoing. And you can have sexual assaults that are ongoing and that people have to respond to. Uh, you know, there can be someone, you know, screaming in the middle of the night for help. You need to send a police officer to that, which is why we have uh, police officers on staff ready to answer 911 24-7, 365 days a year. And that, that means that they're there. And so that, that statistic that, you know, they, you know they, they only spend a percentage of their time responding to um, violent offenses. Well, that's true, but they also spend a lot of their time waiting to, to, to respond to violent offenses. They have to be there to respond to violent offenses. And while they're waiting, they do other things, whatever that might be. So I think you're pointing to the fact that yes, we have to maintain some ability to respond with force. Uh, in the form of police officers. And in fact, once you accept that premise, if you accept that premise, then you accept 24 seven staffing of police, which means that they're going to have to fill their time with doing some other things. And, they're, and it's cost effective to use them for, for things other than just responding to those most uh, crisis demands, because those things are, are, are not 24 seven happening in most communities. 
So we're not changing anything really about either one of those things right, right in this bill, except for one small thing that we do do, which is sort of obvious, but it's actually not technically, there's not a, if, if it's, we, 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 one of the things we say in this bill is that it is rape for a police officer or anybody else with that kind of authority, you know, law enforcement authority to have sex with somebody in their custody. custody. Um, that is not, that, that would be rape anyway, but we're making it clear that it's rape. So that's one small thing related to sexual assault that we do in this bill. But otherwise, it's what I said. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so let's go by hands now, because I think people have started to figure it out. Uh, Steve Salucci is up. Steve, thank you for, I know Steve's been uh, participating in a lot of these calls, and I appreciate your focus on, on these issues. Steve. Well. Sure. Hi, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name's Hope, and I talk to you as well. I'm Stephen's wife. Hey, Hope. <laughs> so um, I, I agree with you that this is a really strong bill. Um, I think, if anything, I'm on the camp that it could, could even be stronger, but I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for all the work that's gone into this. And my question is, what chance do you think it has of um, you know passing and being signed by the governor in its you know, current strength? Well, I have a lot of confidence that the Senate will adopt it. I mean, I you know I can't take anything for granted because there's 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 actually sort of a ruckus developing about various issues in it. Um, you know, I think I think some things we've done in the bill have have, have set people off, police off, particularly uh, police that where they I think they have some misunderstandings of what's in the bill. But I think I think we'll keep it uh, between the lines and get it done in the Senate on Thursday. I'm hopeful about that. Um, I I do feel that. Um, you know, then the House has, to, and I'm confident that the House will do their bill. I, the House has expressed the intention to do that, and I, I have no doubt that they will pass a bill on the House. Uh, and I know Representative Rogers and Representative Hecht will be uh, pushing for that. Um, and then, then, the, then the real question is, how quickly can we resolve the differences between the bills? Um, and that is always a challenge. But I think certainly uh, from the Senate side, and I'm sure from the House side, uh, there is a great desire to work collaboratively and get through this process so we do put something on the governor's desk. So I, I am um, I'm not taking anything at all for granted, but I'm very hopeful that we'll be successful in that. And that'll be a sort of my personal hope and mission for the next few weeks. Great. Thank you. Jackie. Jackie Van Leeuwen. Hi. Um, so, yeah, I just became aware um, of somebody contacted me through my job who didn't want to call the police, but she was in a um, an unsafe situation at her home. And I did quite a bit of searching and literally found nothing in our area. Um, no place for her to call. Um, no local shelter, no 24 hour number. Um, so I just, I don't, doesn't sound like that's part of this bill, but I guess oh. I'm just putting that out there as something that was kind of upsetting. Um, well, no, that, that's terribly upsetting, but there are, there are resources and that, you know, we do go in waves, right? And so this state is, you know, police violence is our concern right now, but domestic violence was our concern in, you know, 10, 20 years ago, uh, and, and it was really top of list. And part of the problem was, was the feeling was police didn't take it seriously enough um, and would sort of say, you know, hey, knock it off and then leave. Um, but so now there's a whole lot that we put in place to um, assure that police take domestic violence seriously. And there's also a whole lot that we've, and, you know, training requirements. And, and then there's also a lot of resources in place for domestic violence shelters. So if your friend is having any difficulty finding a domestic violence shelter, they exist and um, they can your friend can call me or uh, Jane Doe is, is the organization that, that comes to mind right away. But we, we're very committed in the Commonwealth to making sure that every uh, person who is the victim of domestic violence has a pathway to safety. So uh, hard when, I mean, I, you know, literally just Googled, but Watertown Mass, you know, domestic violence resource, you know, I mean, in many different forms. Um, well, on the Watertown town site. Um, yeah. So anyway, I don't want to get bogged down, but no, it, no, no. It but obvious I mean, to me, and it, so I'm sure it wouldn't be obvious to someone who was really shaky and 
you know, yeah. and was afraid, just didn't feel comfortable calling the police for whatever reason. Well, if they, you know, you know call the police, if they call the police, they probably would have gotten a referral to a domestic violence shelter because the police know where to go with that. And that's actually, that actually, they probably would get a very good response from the police uh, on that. But if they're not comfortable, they should, they can feel, feel to call their legislator wherever they live. Um, and if it's Watertown, they can call me or they can call representative Hector, they can call representative Juan. And um, one of us will be extremely eager to, to help them get where the, the, to the, um, resources that will work for them. But it should be public because they don't always know their rep and, but yeah. Okay. And then I just had one other quick, um, that I'm wondering with the, um, I really like what you said about the police accountability system that you're, that's being proposed. And I'm wondering if you've, what you've had, um, reactions you've had from the police unions about this. And if you have, you know, if anything is in the bill that kind of addresses that well i guess if it's a state law they have no choice but well you know look it's a conversation it's always a conversation we respect the police unions uh you know and, and um are, are listening to their concerns uh, they have concerns um and they, they, they're on different levels i think the most because here's what's happening right and this is this is one of the things that we're most focused on getting right as we go through the next couple of days uh when it when a when there's a case of you know alleged police misconduct today, then that's going to get handled in a disciplinary. The first thing that's going to happen is there's going to be an internal disciplinary process around that internal audit investigation. You know, a, some police lieutenant or captain is, is charged with running that investigation, make some findings, make a recommendation to the chief. If it's the state police, there's sort of various layers of appeal. You know. A, a different sort of trial boards and so forth, but in a smaller department, it's just going to go up to the chief. Now, when the, once there's a local internal disciplinary decision, it can go either to um, there can be an appeal, and, and one of one or two, one or both of two possible appeals are may be available. Um, they may be able to go to civil service uh, if in, in a town that's embraced civil service or still embraces civil service, or two, their collective bargaining agreement may re, uh, provide that. Um, an outside person, outside arbitrary trader will will resolve what 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 you know they're they're sort of viewing this as a dispute between police management and the the individual officer, and you're gonna have an arbitrator resolve whether the discipline is appropriate. Um, so that's the system. But now we're doing something completely separate. We're saying there's a statewide agency that can say whether or not you're entitled, you know, you, whether you're able to work as a police officer in Massachusetts. And that agency can independently remove your certification. So the, the interaction between uh, the local um, disciplinary process, which police unions are comfortable with, and this new process is, is that's something that they're anxious about and have concerns about, and you know, understandably have questions about how that's going to work. My view is that it's just completely separate. Um, you know, just as you know, there is no employment relationship between the certification body and the officer. This is a licensing body, um, and they make their decisions. Um, but to, the, to, to what extent should the initial uh, process of going, the, you know, the local process of going through collective bargaining continue um, and, and sort of reach its final conclusion before the statewide board takes action? Uh, this says the statewide board have to take into account their findings. Those are questions that we're wrestling with through right now. So yes, police officers do have some concerns about what we're proposing. Uh, many of them, I want to say, and I should underline this, basically buy into the idea that there should be a statewide certification agency. Uh, they're not necessarily opposed to that, but the question is, how does that interact with the, dis the existing disciplinary process? What level of due process protections do they have? Are they losing something? Uh, and that's the conversation that we are having over the next few days. That was a long answer. I probably went too far into the weeds, but you, uh, but it's it's something I'm extremely um, focused on trying to figure out right now. Thank you, Jess. Hi, thank you. Um, so I was reviewing this bill, and I was wondering. Um, you know, with all of those use of force reductions that you were speaking about at the beginning. Yeah. The, 
the regional law enforcement councils are exempt from those guidelines. And I was wondering if there's a reason for that. Uh, that doesn't sound right for me. Um, yeah, so the definition of law enforcement agency that's used for that is the chapter six, section 220 definition, which doesn't include those councils. Um, yeah, but I think, but see, remember that those councils are comprised of law enforcement employees. Uh, they, they don't employ people directly. They are, they're basically collaboratives across, of, of, um, of, of departments. They have their own personnel. Beg your pardon? They have their own uh, officers, their own personnel. Mm -hmm. Like at the recent Brockton protests, there were SEMLEC officers there working crowd control. Yeah, but those some like officers are employees of somebody at, of you know Brockton or some other agency outside Brockton that are brought in. They're not. There's. There's. No, they're not a standing army of officers. They are. They are people that come in from uh, the individual departments. You ask an interesting question, and I'm going to double check that, Jeff. Jess, but that's an answer that I'm about 98 percent confident in. That all of those officers. I don't even think they employ like a. Um, regional director. It's usually one of the chiefs is surgeon, serving as the regional director. But the officers, that's the idea, right? Uh, is that um, the reason they form these collaboratives is, is to allow, is to sort of create a system the way the firefighters do that allows them, you know, like you strike a three alarm fire in, in, in Watertown, you're going to have firefighters come from Cambridge and Boston. In the same way, this creates a mechanism for a regional response to you know, some kind of disorder situation where they think they need a lot of officers, but it is not its own employing agency. So just, I'm, you and I, I'll check on that. We can have a further correspondence. And, and Maybe I'll... I misunderstood. It's just one of the definitions explicitly includes them as a law enforcement agency, and one doesn't. And the one that doesn't is the one that's the use of force guidelines. Oh, well, you know, I, I'm really glad you, you you brought that up, Jess. I'm going to double check that myself, um, and um, we can follow up on it. But but that's my answer. Is I, I think they're they're absolutely subject to the same uh, use of force guidelines, and we'll double check that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Nice read of the bill. I'm glad you're reading it that closely. Let me know what else you see. You better let me know in the next day or so, because we don't have a lot of time to fix this. <laughs> Marjorie. You need to unmute, I think, at your end, Marjorie. Yeah, I always forget. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to go back to before people even become uh, police personnel, um, and I'm focused on education. You mean to turn it on. And um, if we take a look at policing in other countries, uh, we see the uh, training uh, takes place over a longer period of time. And um, the suggestion is that that leads to less police violence. Now, of course, um, culture might also have something to do with that. But um, I, I think we need to look at we're, what we're doing uh, in terms of how we're educating our police personnel. And speaking of police personnel, I would really like to see police departments um, include more minorities. Um, I, uh, what else? Um, as for police in the schools, I think that's a wonderful uh, PR opportunity for the police and that people going as police into the schools to serve in the schools really need very specific training, I believe, for that job. Um, I, I think they can lay the foundation for a very good uh, relationship between police and communities if it's done right in schools. And um, finally, um, we mentioned that there, um, the bill includes uh, 
an African American commission, and that there's an Asian commission. And I was wondering about establishing a um, Latino commission. So the Latino Commission is actually an amendment that people are offering. Uh, we may end up doing that. I think that's sort of hard to say. Why would we not say yes to that? I think we're likely to do that. Um, the, the school resource officers, I mean, it is a PR opportunity, and should, but it should be up to the schools as to whether they want to, be, want to do that. Um, I, like, I like the thoughts about additional education. This bill doesn't do too much on that. One thing it does do is say, one of the sort of pathways into law enforcement is to be a reserve officer. And reserve officers get, get typically get uh, less training, and then but then they are able to effectively become full time officers with a very limited amount of training. One of the things this bill does is say that ultimately they have to get a full the full the full academy training that they're currently required to get. Um, I noticed that we're joined by Representative Honan from uh, from Brighton. Thank you, Representative Honan, for all your work in this space and for all, of course, that you do on housing, uh, which is so much appreciated. Um, and I also want to say thank you for posting the uh, the, the Form 990 or the uh, the organizational information for um, NEMLEC Northeastern. What I note what I note in there is that it has uh, ninety thousand dollars worth of salary, which sounds like one person doing sort of coordinating work. So you know the the re the officer resources of that agency come from. You know all the other places, and and I do believe they're governed by their use of force standards. But I do look forward to double checking on that because it's certainly very important that they should be, and that's absolutely our intention. Um, Ronnie, <laughs> yeah, we were talking about education um, in particular, um, including more minorities on police. Uh, yeah, the, the, the sorry, I mean, the, this doesn't do too much in the way of reforming a hiring process or the civil service process. That is something, you know, it's a, a space we didn't cross into in this bill. Um, we, we did, there is one dimension of this that we do do in, in the state police, we create this cadet program, which provides another pathway into the state police, which, I, which should help, um, you know, expand the diversity of the state police force, which is probably the least diverse state force, the, the least diverse police force in the state. Um, so that's, that's, that is one of the areas of focus of the bill, but I'm not, I, I, I personally don't have a clear sense of how that's gonna work out. That is an area from where we need to do more in future legislation. Ronnie. Hi. Uh, hey, Ronnie. So as usual, I've been writing up some questions throughout. Um, and a couple of responses to some things that people have said so far. Um, first, uh, addressing what Marjorie just brought up about policing in schools, I'm glad that you've made this change to leave it up to superintendents. However, um, the presence of police in schools has only led to mass incarceration of black and brown students. It might be a nice PR for white students, but it does not help black and brown students. Um, I would urge anyone who wants to learn more about this to read Angela Davis or Alex Vitale's The End of Policing. They've written about this extensively, um, that infractions that are seen as just worthy of a slap on the wrist from white students lead to black and brown students being imprisoned and sometimes deported. Um, talking about domestic violence, similarly, a ton of research has been done on this. Um, a lot people have a lot of reasons for not wanting to call the police and have them into their homes. It, they could be deported. They could lose their kids. Um, we need to have systems in place for people to call domestic violence hotlines where they can be assured that police will not show up at their door. Because you know this this bill is a good step towards people being able to regain maybe some faith in the police system, but it's not there right now and domestic violence and sexual assault are ongoing problems. And until we can miraculously change the world and have people trust the police again, we can't be. So that's a very important statement. I'm, I'm actually losing you a little bit, Ronnie, right now. Are you still speaking or no? No, I'll stop. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I. I 
when someone's in the middle of a fight, they're going to call the police, right? And if it's domestic, if somebody's being assaulted at the moment, I'm not saying that they will call the police, but that what I'm seeing, because I know, I know some of the concerns that people have about deportation and, you know, many other concerns they might have, but there isn't any other resource that can really respond to that, right? Or, I mean, I think, is, is there, I mean, what would, what would, what does that look like? I mean, I'm sort of I'm sort of throwing that out. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, Ronnie, if you if you, you, are you I'm Ronnie's muted. So leave, leave leave Ronnie live there. Thanks. I was trying to say I can't unmute myself. Um, I don't personally know what the solutions are. I know there are a lot of people who are working on building solutions so that people don't have to call the police when things like this happen. But there are community-based organizations who are working on this, and I would encourage anyone who's interested to reach out to them. I'll see if I can find. That information and drop it in the comments but um yeah and there, there are also a lot of statistics about police officers being more likely to be perpetrators of domestic violence and assault so i i don't know well that um, was of course one of the big concerns is you know that the, the attitudes towards domestic violence among police officers did need to change and i'm not saying they completely changed but that was that was a huge priority of of um earlier legislation was to really make clear that domestic violence needs an aggressive response. And that was, but that was focused on a police response. Right. And then I just have one more thing, and I would like to just question. Um, you are narrowing authorization for use of tear gas for only when people are in danger, which sounds great. <laughs> but as we've seen in the past, um, people who are intent on doing harm will do harm and then use, but I was scared for my safety as an excuse later on. And so I'm just wondering what kinds of provisions are in this bill and what are you thinking about for, you know, after this bill um, to, to kind of make more, more protections for protesters. Like we saw starting even last year with the, um, the straight pride counter protests, police officers were pepper spraying peaceful protesters. They're still doing it in the protests that are happening now. Um, what does this bill do to help stop that? And I will mute myself. Well, okay. Uh, you, you, you didn't have to mute yourself. That was all good. Um, but the, um, the bill, first of all, says, you, you know, you can't use force. And that certainly includes these weapons. Um, you know, this is these scenes of people just sort of gratuitously, you know, pepper spraying protesters or something. That's just not okay. I mean that's a, that's an abuse of force, uh, and I don't think it's under, I don't think that's okay under today's law, uh, and it's it's definitely not under K, okay under this under the specific codified terms of this law, and so that's the kind of thing that could cause a police officer to lose their certification if they're doing that in a gratuitous way, um, I, and so that's I hopefully we'll have greater accountability on this on that kind of behavior as as a result of this legislation. Um, where it is a decision in a large crowd setting to use that, this kind of, re, this, this kind of um, I'm going to use the word weapon. Um, we're not taking that entirely away from the police. There's a time when that might be less harmful than some other things, like them you know, charging with batons or something. Um, and if they think they have to defend whatever it is. But um, if that happens, then there will be a review by the state if whenever there's a use of those of those sort of crowd control type weapons there will be a review by the state level body as to whether that use of force was justified and in particular whether the kind of pre pre-event planning had been done that's one of the things we really want to encourage is communication between the police and community organizations so that they just don't get to that stage police know what to expect the community organizations know what to expect and people don't get crazy. And you know, the, the people, people lose, get emotional on both sides and things go bad. And so communication is the solution beginning before the event and then during the event. And so that's, that's what we're doing there with that. Not a perfect or complete solution, you know, but, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Dan. Well well, yeah. this is scheduled till eight, but we can keep it open till eight thirty if you like. Oh, let's keep it open till eight thirty. I think there's a lot of questions. Um, Got it. Thank you, Jeff.
Dan? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to turn a bit to where we're going, hopefully, in the very long run. I think everything in this bill sounds good from the level of attention I've been able to give it, but uh, in the long run, I'd like to really have us change the institution of policing. As I see it, police do three different things. They respond when somebody needs emergency assistance that's not a fire truck or an ambulance. They gather evidence for prosecution of criminal cases. And they are the last resort uh, use of violence when that is necessary. I think we need to have all three of those things, but I think we had need to have them in separate departments. And one reason is that you, we have under policing partly because people won't call the police if they think the police are there, but the first resort that the first response is the same as the last resort. You're not going to call the police on your friend that you're in a fight with if you think that your friend's going to get shot. So what I would like to see, ideally, would be a large number of emergency assistance uh, personnel that who, who respond to 911 calls normally, and then a separate agency that... Uh, investigates crimes mostly with electronic means that we need to develop how to use those without infringing people's civil rights. So this is, as I say, a long-term vision sort of thing. Um, and let's- Sorry, I didn't quite get that. I didn't quite get that about the electronic means. What was that? So to prosecute a crime, you need to gather evidence. And so you need to, um, historically, the only way to gather evidence was to have people go there. But now we have cameras, we have drones, we have forensic science. It doesn't have to be the person who go, immediately goes and responds to the situation, then later giving testimony in court about what they saw in the situation. You can have... Uh, one person uh, going and responding in person, and you can have somebody else operating a camera drone. And camera drones are vastly cheaper than people. You could, we could potentially station a camera drone in a box on every corner, and as soon as we have reason to think there's a crime in progress, a drone could be there within seconds as opposed to within minutes that it takes to get a person there. Uh, and the main thing is when a person responds and the people who are involved in a fight or in domestic violence or whatever it might be uh, are talking to a live representative, representative of municipal government, the person isn't there to bust them. The person is there to de-escalate the situation. So you can call that person on your friend who's gotten out of control without thinking that your friend is going to get shot. Yeah. So listen, I, I, I get where you're going. I mean, I, I think we, we all, I think, get the idea that you'd like to respond in a way that de-escalates and that often probably works better with when somebody doesn't come with a gun in most situations. Uh, yes. So the, the you know the notion that you have a you know an officer fully equipped with a gun responding to every situation that that's sort of your go to thing is a problem. Um, I think the challenge that we have it kind of goes back to what Sarah was talking about earlier, you know, which is you know you 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 have to have you have police officers there, and so you're you're sort of saying okay how am I going to build the systems that involve both, both live human beings and technology to respond to the range of problems that I have in my community. And the answer yeah. to that may be very different in different communities. Um, yes. You know, and, and so 
it's it's a really tough question for um, municipal management to really think through. You know, what what how do I build a response? And 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 one of the challenges is that for non-police responses, uh, you, you you probably want to build a regional network and regional regionalization of services is is a, just a spectacularly difficult thing to accomplish politically. Um, because people like their local control. So uh, well, I, I think I think you're, you're pointing to a very broad category of questions that I think we all want to keep asking and working towards. Uh, but I'm just sort of saying that I don't think they, it's hard, it's hard. I don't, I don't know what the right answers are. Let's see, yes. I think that it might be better to regionalize the last resort because you don't need very many last resort. That's not a 24 seven thing, as you said. Whereas you need a lot of people to have people on call 24-7 for emergency assistance. So that, that every town's going to need. I think that's actually a good point. Uh, the, the other challenge, of course, is that you want emergency resistance to respond fast. So you don't want it to be coming from 10 miles away. You'd kind of like it to be uh, just a mile or two away so they can get to you fast. But those are... Those are the questions that we have to struggle with. I mean, that 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 question of response time is an important, really important part of the equation. One last thing, uh, I'd say that to a large extent, we don't build our institutions; we have them evolve. We True. try to do something, and then we try to make do with what we've set up, and it turns into something else. And every now and then, hopefully, we get a chance to step back. Uh, and try to build something. Thank you. This is well said. Well said. Thank you for that. Um, Patrick. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thanks, Senator, for hosting this forum. I My question was to do with the um, moratorium on facial recognition software. Yes. Um, I believe you said it was, did you say it was for one year? Is that correct? Uh, this is a subject of continuing conversation. By the way, let me recognize that uh, Dave Rogers, who is on the call, uh, is in the in the house, has been very active on this issue. Um, the, the the bill, as currently drafted, imposes a moratorium for till the end of 2021. That's okay. actually subject. You know, people are talking about that. What should we? What what what? We'll settle on something which may be that or something different. Yeah, um, I guess in that case, my question is, when it does expire, who has the authority to revisit that decision? And, you know, how can we be sure that um, it's not something that will just be quietly reintroduced, you know, a couple years down the road after some of the outrage has, has died down? Um, right. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. There's there's no guarantee on that. I mean, it's 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 an ongoing process, so it depends on on advocates staying engaged on it. Um, there are, you know, the the civil the Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts has this as a high issue. I don't think they're going any place. I don't think the issue is going to go away. So I wouldn't worry that the issue will go away, but I would be concerned about whether the legislature will focus on it in the future. Um, and but there isn't a consensus to totally ban this stuff yet. Um, and so we have to go through a conversation about that. And, um, you know, that's going to take some time. And the 18 months may not be long enough for that consensus to be built. We'll see. But that's, that's, that is definitely a subject that people are continuing to talk about. And we'll see what comes out of the, out of, out of the process over the next day or two. Thanks. Fair question. Thank you. Um, Emily? Emily McTiernan. I think you're unmuted, Emily, if you're still there. Well, we'll keep going. Let's let's recognize Steve Salucci and come back to Emily. Uh, uh, Steve? Thank yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Senator Brownsberger. And uh, I just wanted to go back to the question about um, the sort of 8% of calls versus, you know, needing someone uh, 24 hours for, for sort of like immediate responsiveness. And I think it ties in with uh, what I heard some others talking about too, with this broader question 
to me of um, at some stage addressing whether there's a willingness to actually reduce the scope of, of, of law enforcement and replace it, you know, with, with other departments. I didn't hear a lot of in the, in the bill you presented um, in this regard. And I'm just curious, like, what, you know, look, not, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but it, it seems like a question that at some stage would need to be answered. And I'm just wondering like what the, uh, the climate in the Senate, the Senate seems like um, in terms of, you know, ultimately when it comes down to it, is there a willingness to actually reduce the scope and reduce funding in, in uh, law enforcement for those reasons? So that's a very fair question to ask. I mean, I think this bill, I think where we really knock it out of the park in this bill is on the police accountability and use of force. And we hope that will make a difference in reducing risk. Um, I think the other things that we do are sort of more in the category of a step in the right direction as opposed to like a final solution. If, uh, I shouldn't use that word, but you know, a, uh, the, um, the, the um, movement away from um, movement, you know, it, it is a theme of the bill to shift resources from force and punishment to de-escalation and helping. You know, let's calm people down instead of holding them down. Let's lift people up instead of locking them up. Those are themes that have you know, pervaded the work we did in our criminal justice reforms of 2018 as to the back end. So I think we've done a lot on the back end, uh, but changing on the front end, um, it's a longer conversation. And, and, the, and I think part of the reason for it is that it requires building new systems. And that is not something you do overnight. You know, you, you don't, I mean, you, you can sort of take a vote to do something like that, uh, but it's gonna take you, you know, years to, to reconstitute. And we don't have a vision for that yet that, that people have bought into. So yeah, I think we have a lot more work to do on that score. Steve, continue, go ahead. Give Steve back the uh, microphone. Jeff, can we have Steve? He's probably trying to find you, Steve. Okay, yeah, yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I completely uh, understand where you're coming from on sort of the longer term nature of that. And that question, I just wanted to say that, you know, I do think the bill is the first step. I'd like to see more, um, but uh, specifically framing in terms of, um, uh, you know, I, I think this is a really interesting example with the uh, percentage of calls being so low that are actually requiring a sort of force response compared to what does it take to actually have someone staffed around the clock. I just wanted to add in this sort of notion of like, um, potentially like other, other models, right? Other ways to sort of create that result of having uh, responsiveness, perhaps without, you know, somewhere between, like, can we only have 8% of the resources to all the way to 100%? Like, there, there, there might be some creativity, some room, you know, like, like uh, for example, adopting some of the models from that are used in healthcare um, or emergency response in those areas where there is, you know, there's responsiveness, uh, there's on, they're like on call model for, for, for physicians, for example. Um, just, just kind of like, that's that's kind of how I'm thinking about this, and so I, I, you know, that's why I'm asking. Like, in the end, to imagine solutions like this, I think there needs to first be a willingness to say, okay, are we are we actually like up for this from from a, like you said the front end? Are we up for saying we're gonna there's gonna yeah there's gonna be less money for specifically the police department, but that's okay. And and if if those people need who who were police officers need jobs let's deal with that separately. You know, no one should go without a job. So anyway, I, 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 again, I appreciate the steps that this bill takes. Um, and I appreciate that that's a longer conversation. So yes. we'll, we'll, we'll keep working on it and we'll keep, we'll keep thinking about it. I do think it takes, as you say, uh, some real creativity and, and, and some difficult struggling. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Charlotte. As you do that, Charlotte, I'm just going to step out of view for a second and try to make this air vent that's making noise in my background a little quieter. Hang on a second. There we go. All right. Where are you, Charlotte? Charlotte Simpson? is still on mute, uh, Jeff. Okay. There she is. Hey, Charlotte. Okay. 
All right. I'm sorry. I missed the beginning, very beginning of um, the presentation, Will. But um, one of the things that concerns me is um, that police are rewarded, promoted um, based on number of arrests. And that seems to lead to more arrests. It seems to lead to preying on black and brown uh, communities. Um, and I think the focus ought to be on resolution, not arrests. So um, what can be done along those lines? Thanks, Will. Well, that's a really important question is what are police metrics of success? Uh, this, this bill doesn't uh, purport to uh, change those kind of management metrics. I do think that that is maybe more the exception than the rule to measure police uh, success by the number of arrests. I mean, in, in places, in many communities, there just aren't that many arrests. So, so it's sort of the luck of the draw if you if you were re, you know rewarding people on that basis. But I think it's 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 not something I know that much about. I don't have an overview of of you know how you know, the evaluation process goes. The fact is this, that in most departments, in what, what, when you talk about evaluation, what, do you, what, what's, what is it good for? Well, ultimately, it's, it, the, in most departments, the process is so much driven by, um, you know, seniority and then the, the ability to pass civil service exams. That's how you progress in salary. Uh, so I don't, I actually don't know, but as far as I know that, it's, there's, there's really pretty limited use of those things to define success um, or in, in a way that affects officer compensation. So I'd, I'd really be interested, Charlotte, if, if you could, if, if there was any local information about that that you could surface, and it's something that I'll try to be getting as well, but that's a conversation I'd like to continue. This bill does not speak to it. Okay, well, I had heard this, I thought from a good source, but I'm still trying to track down um, really facts on it and um, so thanks yeah no, i'd be interested in more facts on it i really would and you, you know charlotte said Char charlotte and i talk quite a bit so thank you for all the uh information that you give me charlotte and i look forward to more on that subject okay thanks will uh rory rory tito can you hear me hi hi um, so I just wanted to go back to the proposed independent licensing body um, that will be reviewing police misconduct. Yeah. You said it will be comprised of eight civilians and six police officers? Yes, I believe that's right. I'm just wondering what will be done to ensure that there's equitable representat representation um, from communities that are most impacted by police violence. Oh, um, oh, oh, a lot. I mean, okay. that's, that's very, they're, it's very much written into the bill. When I say eight civilians, they're not just eight civilians. They're like uh, one appointed by the Boston chapter of the NAACP, one appoint, appointed by the N New England chapter of the one NAACP, one who's a survivor of involvement in the criminal justice system. Um, and I think there's maybe a couple others that are likely to be minority seats. So it is not only uh, balanced in terms of civilian, but it's also be really, uh, I would say, even tilted towards uh, heavy representation of, of minorities. And, and by the way, on, on the law enforcement side as well, the, the uh, Massachusetts um, Minority Law Enforcement Officers, MAMLIO, uh, if I'm not mistaken, has a seat. Um, but yeah, that, that's very much in everybody's minds. Great, thank you. Mary. Is Mary is still on mute. There she goes. How's that? Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, a lot of my questions have been answered, <clears throat> but I was concerned about the Citizens Review Board mm -hmm. because it's very clear that the police cannot police themselves. And that's why we're in the mess we're in now. Because it's very easy for them to forgive themselves and each other, but they have no forgiveness when it comes to someone that they're approaching as someone that they, they need to control or um, you know, make do something different than what they're doing. So I think it's very important that the Citizen Review Board has 
some clout because these people are not going to want to give up power any more than anybody else wants to give up the power that they have. And I think that speaks to someone who said something about the willingness to understand that we are all like one human family and we're all just human beings. And that somebody that approaches you with a gun automatically becomes someone a little bit different. So many situations, um, how many situations are actually improved by a person with a gun? You'd have to ask. Um, and the other question I had was about the educational requirements for people who are going to have life and death in their hands. If they're going to be carrying guns, then they certainly should have some kind of a sense of, of what they're doing and who they're doing it with. Uh, you know, like some sociology, some psychology, some human development, not just um, as far as mental health issues are concerned, just normal human development especially when they're dealing with children in schools, which um, yeah, I, I have a lot of doubts about that myself. I think we could do without them altogether, possibly. And I wonder what it would be like if we just had, you know, like in the olden days in uh, England, the Bobbies, they used to call them, how friendly is that, didn't carry weapons. Uh, you know, obviously we can't do that in this country now because everything is so escalated, but everybody's got guns now. It, yeah, this is yeah. too much violence and too many people dying for too many reasons. Yeah. And we don't need to have police contributing to that. So that's that's my that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Um you know, there are uh, I I uh I, I feel like the school resource officer, I should I should I feel an obligation to say, you know, that um, sometimes the school resource officers are extremely positive presence. You know, they, they're helping make the graduations work in the time of COVID and just all kinds of things. So, I mean, often the police, we, I, I just, I, I just want to be super careful not to overgeneralize or paint with a bad, you know, broad brush about, you know, who police officers are, or, or you know, say that they're bad as a group, because I think there's, there are a lot of good folks in that, in that, in that group that are doing, coming at things from the right with the right heart um and um so it's, it's a complicated institutional change process that we're embarked in and i think we want to be respectful in every direction i mean that's how i'm approaching it oh well, absolutely to be respectful but that needs to go both ways absolutely no no no. I, i've been of course of course but it, but right now i think i i do i think right now police officers i know are feeling um you know, there's a lot of police officers who, you know, just are sort of heartbroken of the fact that how badly their reputation has been tarnished by things that have happened. And, you know, so they see people in blue and they see, you know, George Floyd happening. And uh, it's it's hard, I think, for a lot of police officers right now. And I, I just want to kind of acknowledge that as we talk here. Well, I'm, I, I'm glad it is then, because then they, that means that they are human and have hearts for the people that they serve and protect. I truly believe really a great many, great many, and probably the majority of officers really do. Well, that's that would be the hope. But I think we're having this conversation now because we've seen throughout the country that that's not the case in a lot of a lot of times. In the all times, too many that... times, all too many times, we just have to we have to eliminate those things from happening. And we do, and I do take the point, the broader point, that it's nice. Uh, and that it's really better if we can respond to a lot of problems without the use of this kind of, of that kind of presence. Thanks. Thanks very much for having this conversation. Too. Thank you, Mary. Um, let's see, Marjorie's already spoken. So I wanna, I wanna come back to people who have to come to people who haven't had a chance to speak yet. So I'm gonna jump to Sarah Kulsbergen. Um, yes, hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Bill, uh, Will, for organizing this meeting, and I'm sorry I missed the, be missed the beginning. Uh, I guess just echoing what a lot of people have said of um, that I haven't read the bill, so I don't know if it does address putting more funds or shifting the, the funds or the putting more focus on shifting the resources to get, shifting 
the focus from enforcement and policing and putting more, more resources into communities um, so that if there is a case of domestic violence there, in the long run, there'd be domestic violence workers, social workers, mental health workers, getting away from the whole concept of policing. And, um, so that's one of the themes of the bill. It's one of the themes of the bill is let's shift from uh, force and punishment to de-escalation and helping. Mm -hmm. Let's calm people down instead of holding them down. Let's lift people up instead of locking them up. The bill, I would say, makes some modest steps in that direction. The sort of area where we really knock it out of the park, I think, is increasing accountability and uh, addressing force standards so that we'll have less risk of egregious abuse of force and less day-to-day -day minor abuses of force. Those are the major things that this bill, I think, uh, successfully accomplishes, but it does make steps towards uh, taking money from savings from incarceration, putting those into community programming, moving from um, uh, so de reducing the involvement of policing in police in schools uh, so that the sort of school to prison pipeline is disrupted um, and um, a couple other measures in that direction. They're not, I would not call them transformative in terms of the structure of how we're providing services. When we were talking earlier with Steve Salucci about how, you know, that's a big deal and that's going to take some more time. Okay, um, I, I hope I hope that things continue to go in the direction of, you know, away from policing and more from investing in communities, particularly in black and brown communities. I do want to say one thing, just so that people have this in perspective. <laughs> um, I, I just want to separate two different conversations. If you look at the state budget, and really many municipal budgets, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of what's in the state budget is aid to com poverty communities. I mean, like 40% of the budget, budget is mass health, which goes exclusively to people in poverty. We have a huge com commitment in you know, social services. Um, we have a huge commitment in education aid, which is heavily targeted to poverty communities. So half, two thirds of the state's budget is targeted to poverty communities. So we are investing a lot in those communities. Can we invest more? We'd like to have a re increase in taxes to do that because we can't take much out of the policing budget because the policing budget is actually only 1% of the state budget. And it's maybe 5, 10, 15% of local budgets, depending on the community. But um, so the investment conversation is one thing. We're doing it to a large degree already. The question is, what kind of response do you want on the street? And I would separate those questions somewhat because I think we, we do want a helping response on the street. And that is a change. And that is a real change to talk about in many cases. You know, real, there really is something we can do differently on the street. And so we want to think about how to do that. Um, let's see now, Emily, I think we tried to go to, but we couldn't get the, uh, the system to work there. Are you, are you there, Emily? Let's try to get Emily on the line. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Sorry, I was having some um, classic Zoom technological issues. Mm -hmm. um, sure. But my, my question is on... Um, accountability as far as it um, relates to more less visible uh, reforms, such as the training on de-escalation, mental health, um, the teaching of racism, and, and what can we do to really see if those are being um, implemented in communities and how do we hold officers accountable for, for that specifically? For, for getting that training. And, and implementing it in, in practice. Well, um, you know, great question. Uh, getting the training, I think we will have some more visibility into that because we are requiring that the um, POSAC um, actually uh, you know, keep track of, um, just keep statistics on you know, whether officers are completing their various required trainings and those are required trainings. Um, so that, that will happen, but are they implementing it in practice? You know that's a much harder thing to measure, and that's going to be um, you know do, we can have some metrics on that according to the the volume of complaints from different communities, which we, we will be able to see. That will be in a, in a public database that people will be able to look at the volume of complaints, inclu um, including including unsustained un, un, uh, complaints. If we're going to publish a complaint about an individual officer, we're only going to publish it if it's sustained. We're not going to just publish raw allegations, uh, but 
In terms of community impact, we will include anonymized data about the volume of complaints from different communities. So we'll have some metric into that. Um, but then, then I think it really takes the political process in each community to uh, you know, ask, the, ask and answer the question, are we getting the kind of a police response we want in this community? And um, you know, to, to engage with the process. And I know many people you know, on this call are engaged in the process uh, in, in their respective communities, and that's a good thing. Rosemary Burke. Hey, Rosemary. Hi, Will. Can you hear me? I can. Good. Um, thank you um, for uh, ha holding the call. Um, I have two, um, two issues I wanted to um, ask you about. The first was um, someone had asked about um, the Civilian Review Board and what kind of actual clout they're going to have. Um, understandably, the unions are not going to um, um, going to be happy with this, um, and there will be resistance. So, what kind of actual clout is this board going to have? And the other is um, about the demilitarization of the police. Is there a um, is there a public database? Um, each community as to exactly what equipment they have. The, the, I'm talking milita uh, military grade equipment. Is there, is there a public database on that for each community? Um, so uh, there will be. Okay. That's, you know, the disclosure of the military equipment is one of the things that's in this bill. Great. So um, I'll step forward. Yeah, good. The other um, piece I was reading about, did I follow that, that um, it's going to be up to uh, each community uh, when a police department wants to, um, I guess, uh, apply for this excess military grade equipment, are they, um, and then communities, I think you said something about local legislators will, um, you know, town meeting or whatever will have an opportunity to decide. Yep, approval authority. Um, approval authority. Civil authority. Okay. Approval um, authority by the local legislators. So yeah, in Belmont, if they wanted to, yeah, they they, they would have to get a, a approval. Okay. Um, do you think that's a strong enough uh, position to take for really trying to get a hold of um, the uh, military hardware? Well, I think it's a, I think it's the first step. I mean, you know, I, we don't actually know the scope of that problem because this stuff has been a little bit hidden. Uh, but so we'll, we'll we'll surface that. We'll get a better handle on it. Um, and um, I, I, I'm not I'm not sure it's enough. You know, I mean, I, I'm not sure how much further we need to go. Uh, I'm not. I, I you know whether the transparency is going to be enough transparency, whether it's going to surface stuff that happened in the past. I think those are those are good questions. And um, you know, we'll see. We'll see whether we've done enough, and we can keep doing more. This is a, this is a start into the field, though. Okay. But to come back to come back to the first thing that you you asked, I think we we have a we're going to have a very strong. If we are successful in passing this legislation, no one will question the power of this um, central board because it's going to have a lot of power. It's going to have the full authority to uh, review and investigate. You know, hear complaints. They will not be buried in police departments. I mean, Rosemary, I'm. Uh, Grateful to you uh, for your your role in helping um, you know us in Belmont understand some of the problems we were having at one point, um, you know, and that had a huge impact. But those say so it can take years for problems to surface in a police department because they can be held down by the leadership in the police department if the person being complained about is sort of in with the top level clique of the department, yes, especially in a smaller department. But this body will be a statewide body. Uh, where a, a complaint can be made and has the uh, authority to investigate any complaint that it chooses to investigate um, and the mandate to investigate the most serious complaints. So um, I, I, I think the, and this body will, has the ability to take a license away. And so I think it's going to be a very important step forward uh, in transparency and credibility of the whole uh, police disciplinary process. I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful about what we've got on the table. And you know my main passion right now is to make sure that we actually get it signed in, into law. 
Right. Uh, and what are you optimistic about this? And I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah. I'm cautiously optimistic. We're, we're 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 trying to move things fast, and you know, there's lots of ways things can get derailed. Um, and so, um, but I'm cautiously optimistic. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'm I'm uh, I very much appreciate your work on this. This is great. Um, so we have about I'm told we have a hard stop at eight thirty. So um, I've got four more questions, and the one the only person on that line who's not asked a question before is Dolly. So let's go to Dolly. Um, and if you're still up for a question, Dolly, or a comment, uh, we got you. Well, thank you very much. I um, I appreciate this, and I don't want to take up too much time if others had a, a moment to get in his or her last thought. Uh, again, Senator, thank you so much for um, having this discussion. Uh, I I was on another Zoom meeting, so, so this is the beginning. Two quick things. One, um, does the bill define what military means when you talk when we're talking about military grade um, equipment? Yeah, it does. Uh, it, I think it refers to it um, with reference to a bunch of different particular federal programs. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it. I think I think that's how it's defined. So there might be some loopholes in there, but I I, I think it covers the way most military equipment comes down. Okay, because I to me I think it's it's there's all there's military grade equipment and then there's just heavy duty um, types of of ammunition and and paraphernalia that uh, that I think make, for me falls into the category of, of militarization without necessarily being U.S. Army issued equipment. Um, and I just wanted to say if we're really trying to reduce the incidence of abuse and that's what your goal is for the or if that's what the goal is for this bill, I bring up something you and I touched on briefly, um, which is that you know where there is job job preferences for, or job preference for military ve veterans in the police department, I I think that adds to this culture. Of, of reaching for a gun and using force to address a problem. So I would just encourage you and your colleagues to think about that um, because I think if we start at the hiring process, we can avoid people who coming in with an attitude of, of force and might and, and, and weapons as a way to solve problems. We might get a, definitely a step ahead in this whole effort. So I'll stop now and thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, we uh, are not tackling the issue of veterans' preferences in this bill. That is a very, very controversial issue, right? Because we are grateful to the service for the service of veterans, and taking you know preferences away from them in this context is just it's almost a third rail kind of thing. Uh, but on the same, by the same token, I think the observations you make are extremely accurate. That um, for the kind of policing we're trying to build, uh, military training is actually not necessarily the best background. Um, so it is an extremely difficult ch thing, which frankly we did kind of duck in this bill. Um, I, I want to, um, in closing, I, I see. Marjorie, Charlotte, and Jess still have their hands up. Please call me after, uh, and because I'm not going to be able to get to you, I'm going to I'm going to use the last couple seconds to wind up. But but give me a call, Jess, or an email, uh, or Marjorie or Charlotte, and we'll and we'll keep talking. Um, but um, just to come back, there are three major themes to this bill. As I said, I think the one we knock out of the park is the reducing the risk of serious misconduct with new accountability structures and new rules of engagement. We make a significant efforts towards shifting resources. And the last category is the um, fighting racism, where again, we make a, a couple of important steps, but again, not a complete solution to the problems by any means, obviously. So um, I am, Grateful to everybody who's been giving me feedback on this issue for the past few weeks. Um, I've gotten, I've learned a lot. I've gotten a lot of useful things. I've gotten some useful things tonight, which I thank people for. I will get back to you, Jess, on the Nemlik thing. Um, and um, I just want to emphasize that this dialogue is extremely valuable to me, and uh, the, you know, the, I really appreciate everybody continuing to stay in touch on this uh, on this whole group of issues. 
So thank you all so much for, for being with me tonight. And now we I'm told we are at our hard stop for uh, our media coverage. This 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 call, by the way, was it was was broadcast on local cable. I guess I should have told you that at the, at the beginning. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. All right. Thank you.